Welcome to Season 3 of Purposeful Empathy. My name is Anita Novak, and this show is all about amplifying the voices of people around the globe who believe the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. This episode was brought to you by Grand Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by the fabulous Mimi Nicklin, a best-selling author, experienced marketer and strategist, and well-known empathy leader based in Dubai. She is driven to elevate our consciousness about the role of empathy in society and passionate about making the world kinder and more inclusive. The author of the best-selling book, Softening the Edge, and the host of the Empathy for Breakfast show, podcast. Mimi is a passionate millennial opinion leader who is bravely breaking open the conversation about the global empathy deficit impacting our world. Welcome, Mimi. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to meet you. And I would love to know what attracted you to empathy in the first place. I often get asked myself, and I'm sure there's a backstory. So what happened for you? There's always a backstory, right? There's always a backstory. Um, yes, I mean, I I relocated to Dubai about three years ago and I took over a business, um, which I found out after joining was broken, was a broken business. And I, I didn't know that before I took it on. So that became a great challenge um, and, you know, something I'll remember forever, really. Um, and as I was going through that turnaround strategy and looking at how we would pull this business back out and bring it back to life, Um, I was sitting with a business coach one lunchtime trying to understand what on earth was going on in the Middle East. I was new here. And over that lunch, I was talking about intuition. And I was saying, you know, because my intuition, this, that and the other. And she said, Mimi, can I stop you? Is it intuition or is it empathy? And I said, no, 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 it's not empathy. What's empathy? No, empathy doesn't fit in the business world. You know, I'd never even thought of it. Um, But what that conversation did was prompt me to go away and and start understanding what empathy was, start researching the global empathy deficit, looking at the neuroscience. And that led me to to years of research and writing a book and totally changing my life. Um, But yes, it wasn't something I ever planned. It was something that found me. And once I found it, I mean, now I can't imagine, I can't even imagine that conversation, you know, because now I spend every living moment of my day talking about empathy to the world. And of course, realized that was something that had been with me my whole life. I had just never put a name to it until that meeting. So you alluded to this change in your life. Maybe there's the professional aspect, but has this empathy research and odyssey and journey shaped who you are in a different way? Oh, a hundred percent. I'm one of those very lucky people who found 2020 to be a transformation year. And of course, that's not to take away from the immense trauma that our world is still going through. But it did allow me the time at home and the time out of, you know, a normal sort of 17 hour working day to really focus on this work in a way that I wouldn't have been able to had I still been in the office for all those hours every day. Um, So, yes, it's totally changed my life. I've recently quit my corporate role. I now do this full time. I'm writing my second book. Um, I'm about to launch the world's first global empathy platform. Um, with the with the specific goal of imbuing empathy into the world and focusing a lot on the business world to do that. So yes, discovering empathy and, and naming it and then, you know, spending all these years writing and talking about it has totally changed my life personally and professionally. So how do you define empathy and, and what does it mean to you? I talk about empathy as perspective taking. Of course, empathy is a very wide topic. Um, But for the work I do, I think it's really important to be empathetic to the audience that you're talking to and make it easy for them, make it easy for them to understand. And so I always talk about it as perspective taking, as being able to stand in the shoes of someone else, to see the world from their mindset, to understand their context and, and the journey to that point that they're at in that very moment. Fundamentally, empathy is about listening, isn't it? It's about understanding other people. And we can only do that by by really, truly listening to them. So that's what it means to me. So some time ago, you launched this uh, breakfast show, right? Empathy for Breakfast, uh, to understand empathy from a a lot of different perspectives. So tell us about some of the episodes and some of the things you've learned through that podcast. 
Yeah, it's been, it's just been so amazing. Um, Empathy for Breakfast is now called the Empathy for Breakfast show, but last year was just Empathy for Breakfast. And it was every Tuesday and it was live. It was just me, my computer and my bedroom. And in the end, 85,000 people came to my bedroom. So it was a huge lesson in connectivity, in the fact that if you can put out really honest, authentic content, People will follow you. People will come. People will support you. Um, so I've had, yeah, the most amazing learning in just asking for support and, and connecting with people that I never would have met. You know, I've, I've made friends and colleagues in the last year that I never would have otherwise. And I think the other key learning is that people really want to understand this. Of all the speaking I've done over the last year, as yet, touch wood, I've not had a, a person who said, well, what rubbish? You know, this, this doesn't, this doesn't mean anything. I think when you can put empathy into today's terms and actually sell the case for why we have it and why we need more of it. And that this is just a human imperative. This is not, this is not a choice, right? Empathy is behind all of modern civilization. So without it, we simply cannot thrive. Can we survive? Of course, but we're surviving right now. And let's look at the planet. We're not doing well. So, you know, it's really taught me that if you can inspire people you can convince people that otherwise wouldn't have necessarily been thinking about this. And in terms of what I've covered, all kinds of things. I've talked about how the FBI uses empathy. I've talked about the psychology of empathy. I've talked about empathy and creativity and, and songwriting. I've all kinds of areas. I mean, there really isn't an area in life where empathy doesn't have a role because understanding each other is fundamental to nearly everything we do. So Yes, and at the moment, I'm now, as I've said, I've renamed it the Empathy for Breakfast show. And now it's a weekly show where I interview people just like you're doing now um, and have a very similar conversation with some phenomenal people from around the world. And again, I've learned that if you ask, people often say yes. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Now, I see the book over your shoulder, Softening the Edge. And my understanding is it's a book about empathy and how empathy is basically the most fundamental of all our leadership skills. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. Yes, it is. It's a book that really sets the case for why we need empathy in leadership and in the workplace. But it's based in my story. So it's a very accessible read. It's not like a serious leadership book. You know, I talk about my journey and, and what I learned about empathy to turn around this business. We grew around about 500% in under two years. So we we really used it well. Um, and it tells a story of how if you look after people, people look after you, you know, and that really fundamentally we can balance humanism and capitalism. We don't need to grow in spite of human success. We can do it together. You know, if we put people beyond profit and I choose beyond really carefully, um, we, we can do both. Empathy can grow our bottom line as well as our people, you know, as well as caring for our people. And it talks about the mental health issues we have in the world and the fact that the second biggest killer of our youth is suicide. And our children are choosing not to stay on the planet instead of stay here with us. So this couldn't be a more important conversation to humanity. And of course, five sevenths of our week are in the workplace. And we've got people with burnout all over the place. We've got nearly 400 million people with depression. It is the highest burden on our um, health services worldwide now is, is depression. And of course, we're in the middle of a loneliness endemic. So we may be in the middle of a health pandemic, but the loneliness endemic is actually far wider and longer reaching. It's been around for a longer time. And now the data shows that the risk of death associated with loneliness is more severe than smoking and obesity. So I unpack all of those issues. But as I said, it's fundamentally about the workplace and how we take on these social issues and apply them to our working environment and, and look after each other. Yeah, so what you say kind of speaks to me, certainly, and I imagine a lot of our listeners and, and viewers that, that, yeah, we need more empathy in the world, and we certainly could use more empathy in the workplace. We spend, you know, a lion's share of our time at work with our colleagues. So there's like a general, yeah, okay, I buy that. But then how do you actually operationalize empathy in the workplace, either, you know, from leadership to the team or within the team or even within all the stakeholders across the supply chain, customers, all of that? I think that fundamentally, the first step has got to be awareness, which is why I'm doing and probably a little bit why you're doing what you're doing, right? Spreading the word, explaining to people what is empathy and, and why do we need it? As I said earlier, it's very rare for people to, once they understand it, to not 
for it not to make sense to them. But the first step in imbuing that into a workplace or any organization has to be awareness. People have to realize that there is an empathy deficit and what the power of empathy is to turn that around. I think the second step is then to sort of infiltrate that into culture, right? What you don't measure cannot manifest. So this has to be infiltrated into the system, you know, into the culture. Fundamentally, it has to come from the top. If you don't have senior buy-in, this is going to be a, a very difficult change to make. Um, and putting in place a whole lot of structures and learning methodologies, I guess, for people to remind themselves, because we're all born with it. We all know how to do it. We're just not doing it. So teaching staff how to use that in the workplace and embedding those skills. And as I said, measuring them, so building them into KPIs or if less formally, just expectations from that leadership team and, and within a, a culture of people. Um, and then, as I said, of course, manifesting that. So measuring it and making it something that you can stick to. So that might be creating an empathy manifesto or some processes or agreements in the team of how, how we talk to each other, how we listen to each other. Um, and how the working environment is. You know, if you're going to talk about empathy, you have to have an environment that is empathetic to people. So, yeah, I would say it's that sort of three step process, really. Um, but fundamentally, it's about a choice. As I said, you know, we're born with it. So you can choose to empathize. And that's really up to you. And do you feel that the pandemic has actually exacerbated the need for empathy um, across the board, but in particular in the workplace? I'm not sure if it was just the pandemic. I think this time has, you know, sped up the need for more empathy. I think you look at some of the social movements around the world, like Black Lives Matter and Me Too, and, you know, there's hundreds more. Um, you look at the state of just many of our nations, many of, of, of the state of politics and the way people are treating each other. You look at the healthcare system. And as I said earlier, the, the amount of mental health issues that we have in our world. I think when you put all of those things together, absolutely, there is a higher need now for empathy. But that is, of course, because we're off the back of 30 years of declining empathy. So the lack of empathy is creating a need for more empathy. And the, the more disconnected we are, the less we understand each other. Of course, the higher all these issues become. People become more segregated, more lonely, more biased, more all of these things. So I think the world needs empathy. Do I think the pandemic had a role in that? I think the pandemic changed people's sense and awareness of it certainly when I started writing this book nobody knew what empathy was you never read about it it wasn't in the media it just wasn't a thing and as I said in my own story it certainly wasn't in the business world the pandemic has elevated people's awareness for that so I think now for sure me I'm sure you in your work there's a demand for it because the pandemic has allowed people to slow down enough and to suffer loneliness to a different level whereby they have now reframed what they understand of this need for human connection. Mm -hmm. So I think it's been a good change in that way, in that this elevation of awareness has certainly allowed us as practitioners in this space to have this conversation more widely. Yeah. And so I often talk about the win-win of empathy, right? Whether you're, you know, leveraging empathy to create positive change in the world, the benefit that, you know, you get from extending that empathy, but there's also a business case too, right? For more empathic organizations. Could you talk to us about um, the, the connection between empathy and creativity or an innovative mindset? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that's such a passion for me as someone that's always been in advertising agency. So fundamentally I'm a creative, I'm a writer. I mean, I was a writer before I wrote a book, you know, I, I write, I've written every day for my whole career. Um, and absolutely, when you walk into an advertising agency or a design or an architectural firm or anything that's a very creative environment, you'll see that there's one key thing that's missing. And it's a, it's a great thing to be missing. And that's self-censorship. There is no self-censorship in an ad agency. <laughs> it's a free-for-all, right? People wear what they want, do what they want, play what music they want, create what they want. They can be as crazy as they want. They can work as long as they want. Uh, people are free. So, you know, that is a real interesting point for me is this link between self-censorship and empathy. And, and I write about it in the book, which is that when empathy is high, when we have emotionally intelligent environments where people feel seen and heard, they feel less judged, they feel able to be themselves, self-censorship uh, declines. And when self-censorship declines, creativity and innovation increase. Design thinking, the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes, to understand others, the ability to think freely, speak freely, share freely, um, all improve our ability to be creative. And of course, beyond that, 
empathy is at the core of creativity because how are you ever going to create for other people if you don't understand them? And I think in our industry, we were very good at that in the ad industry, um, even 10, 15 years ago, and now less so. You know, we're, we're less connected to human beings that buy our products and our services now than, than we have been in previous years. So yes, I, I talk about this a lot. I believe that empathy is intrinsically linked to improve creativity and just sort of out of the box thinking, innovation and strategy. You know, str strategy is also, you know, deeply creative. And if you're not able to express yourself, we will never be able to reach the sort of pinnacle levels of strategic thinking in an organization. So what would you say to critics who might say, oh my gosh, now we're going to take empathy and whitewash or pinkwash or greenwash or whatever color is going to be, the rainbow wash or yellow wash, empathy, you know, to sell more shampoo to, you know, what do you say to the critics that like leave empathy alone? Look, I think it's going to happen, isn't it? Because it's already a bit of a buzzword and um, that's probably going to happen. People are going to start throwing it around and pretending they're using it when they're not. The thing about empathy is it's very easy to sort of sniff out a fake because it's intrinsic to our neurobiology. So as human beings, we do know when people are faking empathy, it just doesn't feel the same. So, you know, those that really are not authentic with it will just not see the results because it has to be real. This is, it's, as I said, it's evolutionary. It's built into our brain. We know how to respond to it very naturally. You know, it's like smiling, huge part of empathy. Um, and eye contact, these things are contagious and that's in your subconscious. Your body physiologically responds to a smile um, as part of the connection point, right? So I think you're right. I think it will happen. Um, but I think we don't have a choice but to continue to elevate the conversation, whatever happens on the sort of, you know, outside edges of that. Because as we've said before, we have this huge decline, three decades of it, and it's killing people. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a choice. There's gonna, there's always negative, negative sides of decisions and choices and movements in the world. And there will always be people that take a really positive movement and perhaps skew it. But I, as I said, I don't think we have a choice. I think we, we need to look after our people. And uh, there's a group of us that are really passionate about it. We've just got to keep forging forwards. Right. So on that note, you're writing a new book. Tell us about what that's going to be the topic, the theme and, and this platform. What's the vision? What's the dream? Uh, so the new book is about curiosity. So still about empathy. I mean, everything I, I do will always be about empathy, but specifically curiosity within that space. Because what I realized in the last year is I talk a lot about curiosity or inquiry, driving understanding, but people don't really know how to do it. Because again, we've become so disconnected. Um, and, and for many of us, we grew up in the, the 70s and the 80s. We were told by our parents not to be curious. It's rude, darling. Don't don't ask too many questions, you know. So um, we grew up in a way that we were actually not taught to really be curious. And certainly in our school system today, we're not teaching children to really be curious because they tend to follow very sort of rigid um, curriculums. So the next book is more about uh, about curiosity within the empathy space. And the platform is called Empathy Everywhere, empathyeverywhere.co. And it launches in a few days from now, in about a week. Um, and the goal of that platform is to just spread empathy. You know, that's its pure goal. And it does two things. Um, it allows me to work with, with corporates and organizations or institutions and have these sort of conversations, uh, workshops and something called the listening rooms, which is a, a methodology that I've created to teach people to listen and connect with people. So really giving organizations a systematic way to, to do that. But also we have a studio, a creative studio, um, that is going to really focus on, on developing creative and marketing solutions that have empathy at heart. And the goal of that studio is to stay very small and take on very specific projects that really, as you, as you mentioned, want to do things authentically with empathy for people around them. Um, and to gather a group of people that believe in that and that want to create within that and create some really human solutions for the world. So Yes, it's a platform that's geared to create empathy in many ways, either with people or by marketing. Right. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you about was how you feel we can work together to elevate this deeply human and evolutionary skill. Is that platform it or do you still imagine other ways? I think I think any platform like this and, you know, mine won't be the only one for sure, um, a part of that, a part of that journey. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think the discussion and the awareness of it is so important. My 
sort of key phrase that I just love and say every day is that the more the world talks about empathy, the more empathy the world will have. So I think for all of us to continue the conversation is the most important thing, to have these discussions, to share it with the world, to teach our children. Because someone asked me this week, but Mimi, how are we going to make all this change you know, quickly? I said, well, we're not going to make this change quickly. You know, We've got decades ahead to fix this. And of course, the youth and, and the ones below the youth, the children, are a huge part of that. So teaching our children, helping our schools bring up responsible children that understand how important human connection is and understanding each other is. Because as we've said a couple of times, this is fundamental. This is bottom of the pyramid, right? Bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. We need this to thrive. We need this to continue to grow. So I think that that conversation is incredibly important. Mm. And as a last question, Mimi, I'm, I'm getting into the habit of asking my guests if they would share a story um, where they were on the receiving end. So can you think of a time, a moment where you were on the receiving end of empathy or what I call purposeful empathy? So empathy on purpose uh, and what that meant for you? You know, probably, <clears throat> I'm, I think it is purposeful, but probably my daughter, who's only just turned four, so she's tiny, she's probably my best example of receiving empathy on a frequent basis. And I think obviously that's a two-way street. You know, her and I um, are extremely close and, and that's sort of how our relationship is built. But yes, I think she has an innate ability to understand what I'm doing and how I'm feeling and always comes up and says just, you know, the most amazing things that always make you want to cry because they're so cute, because they're so small. Um, but recently I had a cold and, uh, you know, I was not feeling well. And so I was sitting on the sofa and I was on my phone and she came over to me with her teddy and her blanket and said, mommy, I thought these would help you feel better because when I was sick, they made me feel better. Um, so, you know, just the most beautifully simple and innocent example of that, that was exactly what empathy is. She could understand how I was feeling and connect that through her imagination to how she once felt and created her own little solution, which you know resulted in a blanket and a teddy bear. But yes, I think um, that's probably the one that comes to mind, you know, because it's in my home and, and she's, she is, she's a fantastic example of, of how children can learn empathy. And, you know, she empathizes with everyone we meet, every shop person, every security guard, every person in her life. She's like a little beacon of empathy running around the barn. <laughs> uh, beautiful. My daughter's turning five in a couple of weeks, so I completely understand um, okay. what you're describing. Yeah. So Mimi, thanks so much. We're going to have all the details about how to reach you, your book, your platform, your website, all your socials in the description below. Thanks for taking the time. Good luck with your launch next week. Thanks for everybody who is watching and listening. We'll see you next week. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from whatever is holding you back? At Grant Huron International, you get to select the coach of your choice anytime from any place. Visit GrantHuronInternational.com to harness the power of on-demand coaching today.